Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on with us a special guest, John Atek. John, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. John, you are the renowned author of Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky, certainly one of the definitive works, if not the definitive work on Scientology. When I first read it, I was blown away by your research. And um, you write in, in um, somewhere, I believe, that it took six years to research your book. Yeah, I mean, and you need to add in the nine years I was in Scientology before that, really, because a lot of it was, you know, recollecting you know, what I've read, read of Hubbard before that. But I spent six years interviewing people, reading testimony, reading letters, and it was a very fortunate time because I was working in the 1980s. So many of the important witnesses, like, say, Helen O'Brien or Barbara Cloden, were still alive and still available and willing to talk. Um, and it, it was an incredible journey. It really was. So many people, so many stories. Well, I could imagine. Now, for new Scientology watchers, and, and certainly Leah Remini's show is uh, has attracted a lot of new interest. Just a brief a brief background in history. You entered uh, the Church of Scientology when you were 19 years old, I believe, in 1973? 1974, December 74. Um, I was in for nine years, and, and I'm really quite unusual. I, I, it, it took me a few years to understand the difference. Uh, when I left Scientology, I was outraged that disconnection of, was being enforced. And... Um, I kind of stood up and put my address on things. And then I realized that, that nobody in the UK had ever done this. Nobody had ever stood up and said, here I am, talk to me. And I came to realize that I was able to do this because I'd not been abused and humiliated and traumatized in the way that you know, I came to realize almost every Scientologist is. Because I'd never been on staff. I'd certainly never been in the Sea Org. I'd never been a live-in member. And because I was a, an artist and a writer, even though I didn't have any money, I was treated as a celebrity. So I didn't know about any of the bad things that were going on. And the, the two times that people shouted at me, I shouted back at them because I didn't realize I wasn't meant to. And that it makes a tremendous difference. It, it, it's so much easier to recover if you've not actually been fully immersed, you know? Oh, yes. I, I, and um, one question I did have that, that uh, I'm interested in, during your Scientology career, the nine years you spent, you were at St. Hill largely, right? You, you did most of your services yeah. at St. Hill? Birmingham and St. Hill. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as an artist, a writer, an intellect, I need to know this. It's just sort of a guilty pleasure to ask. <laughs> when you opened the OT3 materials for the first time, what was your impression? Um, I thought it was crazy. and but, but something happened. One of those odd quirks of fate. A guy looked across the very shabby room at St. Hill where the OT courses were originally delivered. And I'd opened the famous pink folder and read the stuff. And he saw the puzzled look on my face. And he said, yeah, it's just like Colin Wilson's mind parasites. And that was a weird thing because that was pretty much what I was thinking. This novel by Colin Wilson about these alien entities that feed off brainwaves, you know, and that you know, convinced me that he must have read my mind in some way. And so maybe this stuff worked. So I went away and did it. But now, what did you think when you opened the pack? When I did read the OT3 course pack, when it got leaked online by uh, Arnie Lerma, it was very fascinating. I'll tell you my initial impression. As a businessman, and I worked for a large corporation, we were concerned with intellectual property, patents, mm -hmm. ownership. And having grown up in the Christian church and around... Um, Oh, the Pentecostal church, demonic exorcism mm. was, co was common. I mean, I, I was familiar with speaking in tongues, demonic exorcism, but also I was familiar with patent and trade law. Yeah. So when I first read the OT3 levels, I thought, now this is very interesting. Hubbard wants to have a finite point in space and time at which these entities appear, incident two of OT3. Yep where Zenu dumps uh, all the people into volcanoes. Unlike Satan and his demons that you exercise in Christianity, Hubbard has a brand name, copyrighted entity. Yeah. And I thought, oh, that's all he's doing. He's assigning ownership so you can only deal with Scientology brand entities. Mm. 
And so I saw it strictly as a copyright thing. And I thought, oh, that's, that's really extraordinary that you would copyright um, an entity that you made up as part of a cosmic narrative. Yep. And because of the nature of consciousness, it's so tractable, mm. you know, that people can actually work with it. Yep. Th that is Scientologists. I mean, I found myself in the middle of the, the suits that, that were aimed at David Mayo and and the people in England who'd gone and stolen the uh, OT levels from Copenhagen. Um, I was, you know, I was in deposition over that because I knew the people involved and it, it was just this incredible thought that suddenly you had a religion that was patented. It is quite something. By the way, uh, my wife Karen was in England when the OT levels were stolen. All right. And she she was actually in, sent over there on a mission to investigate three strange suicides at St. Hill, oh. three deaths, and uh, which were not publicized. But she got sent up to Copenhagen to investigate why the uh, OT course packs were stolen. And the basic answer, and this, this goes to what you were saying earlier, the Sea Org members at Copenhagen, when they thought uh, what was it, an RTC mission had come in to do an inspection. Yep. They were so terrified that RTC, the Religious Technology Center, could come in that they were absolutely obedient. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, the next day, I knew nothing about it before it happened, but the day they got back, um, I, I was there when they were making copies of, of the material they'd taken, and I got the story from Ron Lawley um, and Morag Balmain, who are the people who actually you know, lifted the material, and Ron, I'd, Ron had been growing this handlebar moustache for some weeks preceding, mm -hmm. and I, I wondered why he's doing this, and it's because he feared they'd somebody would recognise him, and he said, we went in there, and, and we said, we, you know, we think you've been squirrelling, and we want to see your OT packs, and what they'd expected was that they'd get an OT3 pack, an OT4 pack, an OT5 pack, whatever, but they brought them all of the OT packs in the advanced organisation. And wow. let them just walk off with them, basically, because, as you say, the the authoritarian aspect of Scientology is is just obedience, just terrible, terrible. Oh, ab absolutely. Now you made it to OT five, mm. and then you were ordered to disconnect from a friend. Yep. And that was it for you. That's when you. That's when you left Scientology. Well, I spent six months doing the things you're meant to do, writing to the Continental Justice Chief, the International Justice Chief, the Grand Pooh Bar, and what have you. I got ev evasive responses because I pointed out that this friend of mine was on a list of um, 611, I think it was 600 and something, suppressive persons, and and it was kind of weird because I been summoned to St. Hill by Peter Shantz, who was then the ethics officer. And he said, oh, this friend of ours, um, he may be declared suppressive. You know, and his guy Peter had known for, I think, 15 years then. And um, so I said, well, what are we going to do about that? And he said, well, we'll fight it. You know, it's the wrong thing. A week later, he called me back in and said, I can't tell you on the phone what's happening. Top secret. And he said, well, he's been declared. And I said, what are we going to do about it? And he said, you know, these people can be so devious. And I said, well, where's the declare? He said, oh, there isn't a declare. His name's on a list. And it was, that really hit me. The idea that this guy a week before, you know, this guy's one of my great friends. I'd do anything to defend him. As soon as he sees his name on a list, he's now a pariah. You know, he's to be. And that, that shifted my view. I spent six months after that doing the complaints you do, ending up with the letter to Ron, which is, you know, and the letter to Ron was something like, I know that L. Ron Hubbard does not receive these letters. However, <laughs> this is the last recourse. And I got a letter back saying, of course I answer my letters. <laughs> and nothing at all, really. You know, your friend can request a committee of evidence. And that was it. At that point, I contacted my friend and he'd actually... He shunned me for six months so that I wouldn't get into trouble. And I contacted him and said, tell me, tell me what's going on. And because he was a, you know, been a senior executive, he was able to put me in touch with various other people. And I suddenly found myself dealing with, you know, Captain Bill Robertson and um, Alan Walter and you wow. know, Chamberlain and, you know, all of these people who 
who'd been around all of these years and were vaguely strange, to say the least. Um, and, it, you know, I became the historian because I, I wanted to know what they were talking about, you know, what had happened. And I started Reconnection magazine in December 83. And uh, we ran to 33 editions in all over the years. Um, just really exploring, but at the same time losing the faith. You know, once I, a few months in, once I realized that Hubbard was a liar, I was done. When, when I, there was no doubt, you, he, he contradicted himself. So this whole idea, he said, honesty is sanity. He said, Scientology is the road to truth. Uh, and the road to truth must be trod with true steps, realising that he was, in fact, a liar, it was over for me. And it has always amazed me in the last 33 years now that people don't go that way. Independent Scientologists, they go, well, yeah, OK, he made up a lot of stories, but nonetheless, he's truthful, you know. And then, of course, as you get into what the technology really is, where it came from, which still hasn't been fully publicly discussed, I don't think, where he took it from, who his guru was, where the ideas came from. When you get into that, you, you realise you're just dealing with this severely narcissistic, profoundly ill human being who exploited everybody around him without any care or concern, including for his own children. In, indeed, his uh, family life was tragic. Scientology is fundamentally a business. One of the things I've realised in reading your work and the work of others and doing my own work is that while L. Ron Hubbard wanted to promote Scientology as a mass movement, it was fundamentally his business. He owned it and controlled it. Yeah. And he, his followers were actually customers. And this is not a trivial thing I'm saying. You really, once you profoundly understand that it was his business and he had customers, then, then suddenly you can take a layer off. Yeah. And, and I think where your work's extraordinary, and it's, it's in Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky, your book. It's so extraordinary because you're very unsparing and your research is excellent. Thank you. Uh, for example, well, you know, it's, research is hard to do. Yeah. It's, it's so thankless and it's so hard and yet it's so important. Especially before the Internet. You know, that uh, there's so much now. I mean, I, before I retired from the scene in 96... I made very sure that the principal documents were on the internet. And uh, so the whole of the Branch One pack, all 800 pages, went up. We went through my archive collection, which you know, is, you know, is represented by Steve Kent now in Alberta. I, I worked for a couple of years on putting his collection together. Um, but we went through everything to make sure that all of the key documents were available. I mean, you talked about Arnie Lerma putting OT3 online. Well, OT3 was available before that. It, it was available. I mean, the first Robert Kaufman was the first person to make it available in his book Inside Scientology in 1973. Um, but, it, you know, I, mean, I don't want to diss Arnie any, anyway. He's done great things. But, but it had already gone up before then. Um, and it was always also available through the Swedish Parliament, of course because the guy put it into the record there where copyright doesn't obtain. So for a few dollars, you could buy the OT5 pack from Sweden, you know. But making it available, and I think people now, of course, they go online, they can find this stuff, they can, you know, put in the title of a policy letter, and there it is. None of that existed. None of it existed. If I wanted to know something, I had to, you know, get the Navy records, get the FBI records, um, write to the Montana Historical Society to find out about his childhood and his grandfather, contact people directly, you know, and it, it means that it, it, was, it was very exciting. I think there's something in the, the difficulty of doing the research. You, know, you had, had to actually go to the courthouse where documents were to get them rather than just looking online. It makes it more valuable. Oh, absolutely, and, and the fruit of your labor will be, will be with us forever. What was the hardest part of researching Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky? I mean, what did you have the most difficulty in terms of obtaining? Because you interviewed 150 people, mm -hmm. your, 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 your footnotes are extensive, your research. But what was the hardest thing for you as a writer and researcher to find out about the man L. Ron Hubbard? The, the question that plagued me for hmm, nearly 10 years, so beyond writing Blue Sky, was, was he evil? 
And it seems like a foolish question, but did he, was he a crank or was he a charlatan? Hmm. And the, the, because I interviewed enough people who'd audited him, you know, he had lots and lots of auditing. If you look to Freud, Freud never had analysis. You know? I didn't know that. I didn't realize that. Yeah, isn't that a weird thought? He didn't trust anybody to do that. When I interviewed, I interviewed Otto Rose at great length. Um, I think we had about nine hours of, of interviews. And he, he got really angry at one point because he was reading something that I'd researched about, um, you know, Hubbard's war career. And he said, but he would sit in auditing sessions and he'd tell these stories. You know, he'd, he'd talk about sinking Japanese submarines or what have you as if it had actually happened. And that offended Otto more than anything. He didn't, he wasn't so much bothered that the man had lied. It was that he'd betrayed his own system, that hmm. you know, he didn't believe in it. So he'd, it was just a way of sitting and chatting. When I interviewed David Mayo uh, back in 86, he told me things that at the time I, I felt I just couldn't make them public because he was being sued by Scientology and he'd taken the position that because he was the co-author of the OT4, OT5, 6 and 7 materials, he had a right to use them. But what he said to me in an interview was that what we have as the OT levels, which were attributed to Mayo, it's OT4, 5 and 6 and 7 that is, he didn't actually write. Hubbard had his annual bronchial pneumonia you know, which is where the clearing course came from, it's where OT3 came from, he'd cured himself. And then the next year, smoking 100 cigarettes a day, got to him again. And uh, he, so he, But he was very ill in 77. Mayo audited him, and he got better. And we in Scientology, of course, were told that Mayo was going to be his successor, and, you know, he was the big man and all of that. And the idea was that he found out that you couldn't run Dianetics on an OT, so you got new era Dianetics for OTs, and all of this body fat and stuff. But what David told me was that he didn't run very many body fatens on Hubbard at all, that the rundown had actually been about misownership. Hmm. Misownership of other people's concepts, you know, which therefore stick to you within the, the notions of Scientology at least. And that you know, the whole body fatin thing, what happened was that after Hubbard got got better he would sit there in session and David would be auditing him and he'd suddenly say, stop, write this down. And as I talked to more people over the years who'd audited him, I found that this was his method of research. He would sit, he'd be having, be on whatever drug he was on because you've got to believe this man was a multiple drug abuser. Um, just astonishing his drug use. So right through the Scientology period, no doubt about it, I, I interviewed so many people who saw this. Um, over the years. And, and, you know, he admits there's a 1950 lecture where he says he'd been addicted to phenobarbital, um, which is one of the more dangerous drugs. And of course, he recommended the use of amphetamines um, in 1950 frequently. If you have to grab hold of anything, grab hold of Benzedrine. So he admitted using uppers and downers. He was a heavy drinker. Uh, He's a heavy smoker. He's pumping all of these things into his system. And then he'd sit in the session and tell the auditor what to write down. And that was the research, you know, whereas we've got this, you know, it's scientific and, you know, there'll probably be a thousand case studies to make. No, it was just whatever was in his head. You know, we talked to Nibs, L. Ron Hubbard Jr. about the research for history of man. And he said, well, you know, I was so pleased to see my dad. You know, he'd abandoned me when I was eight and I was 18 and I came back and he said, yeah, I'll give you a job. And he said, here, take these. And he gave me some speed and he put me on the couch and he said, what do you see? And to find that this book was just Mary Sue Hubbard, Elron Jr. and Elron taking amphetamines and, you know, talking about feeling like clams or what have you. And this is a cold blooded and factual account of your last 60 trillion years. It's awful, awful. Hubbard suffered the fate of uh, becoming a messiah in a modern era when facts are easy to get, mm -hmm. or fair, relatively easy. I mean, granted, it took you six years, but the disjunct between how Scientology was really made and what it promotes itself as, mm -hmm. I, I, I think for so many people who leave the church is jarring. In as much as you actually wrote the book and assembled it, it may have been more so for you because this is a, a journey of discovery as much as it's writing a book. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, I took the years to, 
to make that those discoveries and anybody can now pick the book up and there it is um and hopefully there are enough reference notes that they can go and check you know to you know the book was written for people who'd been through the experience i mean um it briefly was a bestseller on amazon which was nice so it would have been even nicer if the publisher had actually paid me the royalties but you can't have everything in this world but it uh, wasn't written for the general public it, it was written as a kind of deconstruction so that somebody who'd been through the experience could could check. They could go and, you know, so I was very careful with my fact-checking. And, uh, you know, hope by the, 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 the current edition, the 2013 edition, has enough footnotes that somebody can go and, and see. But I think the, the crucial thing for me was the conflict between statements that Hubbard made. So, you know, you, at St. Hill, in, a, in a, a glass case, you've got my philosophy, the handwritten version, Crippled and blinded, at the end of World War II, I faced a non-existent future, abandoned by family and friends, and so on and so forth. Crippled and blinded at the end of World War II, that's, what was the 14th or 15th, depending which side of the dateline you're on. And yet, that was in 65, in a tape-recorded lecture in 1957, called Communication and Isness, which was reprinted as a professional auditor's bulletin, it's in the technical volumes, he says, that he was feeling sorry for himself, and on July the 25th, 1945, he went down to Hollywood, where he got into a fight with three petty officers, and because he was he knew judo, he was able to beat them up. So again, like, somewhere between the 25th of July, where he was obviously not crippled and blinded if he was beating three guys up, between the 25th of July and the 14th, 15th of August, he was crippled and blinded. Yet, as he says, he didn't. the reason he was feeling sorry for himself in Hollywood was because he wasn't going to see action again. Something bad happened to him in California. But then you go back, there's a 1950 lecture called Introduction to Dianetics, which David Miscavige, in his infinite wisdom, I'd never heard of this lecture. I first heard it three years ago because Miscavige published it. And you have these guys where he basically says, I didn't do anything in the war. You know, I, I had, uh, he fell down a ship's ladder, uh, had ulcers, and something wrong with my feet, I think he said in a, an interview with Look magazine. So you get this, the contradictions between his own statements, which prove beyond any shadow of doubt that he was a liar. He was deceitful. If you then get into the technology itself, it has a few sources. I, pretty early on after leaving, I talked with a, a Rosicrucian, um, a member of Amork, the ancient and mystical order of Rosie Crusoe, who was yes. a Scientologist. And he said, when I saw Rosie 3, I really, they'd stolen it. He'd stolen it from the Rosie Crucians. And I said, uh-huh. tell me about that. And he said, I can't tell you about that. <laughs> oh, great. So I just had a hunch and I wrote to Amok in the US, in California. And they said, yeah, he was a neophyte in, I think, 1927 when he was 16. He did the first level of the Rosicrucian business. Now, the bit the Rosicrucian had recognized was the body thetans. And the body thetans is one strand of the technology, the so-called technology, and the engrams are the other strand. And the, the techniques that are applied come from different sources. I found the Worcester, Massachusetts lectures given by Freud in, I think, 1911. And I was fascinated because Hubbard said that in 1923 he'd met Commander Thompson. Uh, Russell Miller actually found a passenger list for a boat that went through the Panama Canal with Thompson and Hubbard on it. So that's true. They, they, well, they're on the same boat. So we presume they met. And Hubbard says this is where he learned about Freud. So I kind of went, well, if it was in 1923, what had been translated into English by then? What was available of Freud's work in mm-hmm. America? And it's these lectures, the Worcester, Massachusetts lectures, not much else, frankly. I'm not even sure that the interpretation of dreams was in a full translation then. Full of questions. Cranker Charlatan, how did you resolve that? Eventually, the the thing that got me was set checking, understanding that when he first brought it out as security checking because people had defected from the Johannesburg organization and were setting up independently, it was security checking. It would, you know, ultimately it would become integrity processing. But he had these great long lists, like the whole track sec check. They dropped out of use in the 70s. And sec checks became this lifetime. 
And that was the thing for me that, that finally the penny dropped, that he wasn't, this was definitely wasn't being done for your benefit. You were being asked questions, which it then would go into your ethics folder. I mean, initially it was done through folder culling, which they claim they never did. I've interviewed enough people who did it, and I've seen orders from Hubbard to do it. So there's no, you know, in the Clearwater hearings, there was a clear train of Hubbard ordering somebody, the guy who did the folder culls, and the guy who was harassed, you know, everybody, and the guy who did the harassment were all there. So you see how it was used. By the time I left in the 80s, it had moved on so that if you said anything in session that could be used against you, the auditor would stop the session and write it down directly for your ethics folder. And it was this realisation that he was actually collecting material on people. And if he'd been true to, the, to, to the, his ideas, he would, of course, been looking for earlier lifetimes where you'd committed over. The whole track set check would have been relevant. But it had dropped out. That opened it up for me. So that I eventually kind of, you know, somewhere around about 1991, I think perhaps the final stroke, I, I wrote a paper called Never Believe a Hypnotist. And what had happened was that the new editions of the books had indices in them so you could check things. So I looked up hypnosis, suggestibility, reverie, that word that he borrowed from the hypnotists, and found that if you went through the research and discovery volumes and the early books, Science of Survival, Dianetics, what have you, there were many references. I pulled together all of those references, I typed them up, and then I cut them out, printed them out, cut them out, and tried to put them in some kind of sequence. And I realized that what he was saying in 1950 to 51 was what he would later d apply as the technology. Very definitely, no doubt, that uh, if you go and read the paper, he contradicts himself at every turn, you know, so in, and I, I'd never noticed it. I've met few people who had, but when you read Dianetics, and I, Modern Science and Mental Health, I read it three times. I didn't notice that on one page he says uh, hypnosis was never used in research. And then another, he says that most of our basic research was done using hypnosis. So finding out that, that he'd applied this method and then, you know, going back to the thing on Freud, in the Freud lecture from 1911, Freud describes Dianetics. He talks about um, not only secondaries and locks, but he also talks about physical trauma, uh, which Hubbard had claimed was the bit he, he got. He uses accounting backward technique to start the process, just as Hubbard did. Um, he creates, they talk about chains of incidents, um, you have earlier similar incidents going to the basic. It's all there. But then Freud explains why he stopped using it. This is really the method that Breuer first used, that is the beginning of psychoanalysis. And he said he stopped using it because it doesn't resolve the transference. So mm. it makes it worse. It makes the, the person more dependent on you. And that was the point where I realized what the key was, you know, that Auditing makes people ever more dependent. And I started to think about auditing junkies, people who have to get the hit. And the three-day decline, which I, I think any Scientologist knows about, whether they're willing to admit it, three days after you've written that success story, you don't feel so good anymore. Unless you got really high out of your mind, you know. But usually about three days, and it's your fault because you're a roller coaster, right? So right. you've got to do something like it. Well, it's a normal thing if you, uh, faith healers, if, if they've you know, got your adrenaline going so you can stand and walk, about three days later, you won't be able to walk anymore. And auditing is hitting on the same thing to get you euphoric, to get your adrenaline and your opioid response going, um, to, you know, to give you very good indicators or the euphoria, which is typical of hypnotic states. And then you feel great, but, but what did you actually gain? You know, how did anything change and how is your life better? Because gradually through the process of auditing, what will happen is that you will be cloned into narcissism. You'll become more and more selfish, more and more contemptuous of other people, you know, of wogs and raw meat, dead in the head wogs, you know, and all of this stuff, ever more elitist, less and less compassionate. Um, so in fact, what's happening is that you're kind of vampirically being transformed into an egotistical narcissist.
What effect does the e-meter have when it's introduced in 53? Because it is, and, and he says it, there are two places where Hubbard actually says it, it's a lie detector. Yes. Now, Scientology always denies that, but there are two, two bulletins where he calls it a lie detector. I've and read it, them. Yeah, and it, it puts that new inference on it. Now, what, what's happened in between the, the little potted history is, Yes, the foundations are all going bankrupt because Hubbard has taken the money out. I, I talk with directors of the foundations, um, Don Rogers particularly, who was on the board of every foundation until 1954. The, I heard this phrase again and again. He spent money like water. People who were around Hubbard, he just spent money like water. So he bankrupted all five of the original foundations. He then, because Sarah has gone public about him torturing her, um, he leaves the country having stolen Alexis from her and hops off with Richard DeMille to Cuba for three months um, to get very drunk on rum and put together the notes that Richard DeMille would write down as signs of survival. Then Don Purcell asks him to come to Wichita and says, I'll bail you out. He goes to Wichita, he gets on famously for a few months, which was the usual case with Hubbard and other people. And then Purcell, to, res to rescue Hubbard, says, look, I'll take on the Dianetic problem. I'll take on the bankruptcy. It's fine. And Hubbard sells the rights in Dianetics for $1 to Don Purcell. Then the judge in court, I think it was $800, he said, you can buy the lot for $800. So Purcell owns up ending Dianetics, Modern Science and Mental Health, the trademark Dianetics and any usage. That's why Scientology began. And what you say about the Guardian's office, yes, it begins exactly there. The first operative I could find was a man called James Elliott. He's on some letterhead as Hubbard's business manager when he makes that move to Phoenix. And he was caught stealing the mailing list of the Wichita Foundation. But he, do, he managed, he, he got caught, but he, Hubbard managed to get the mailing list because Hubbard wrote 31 letters to that mailing list. Uh, which we have, and they're very interesting. Uh, there's a whinging, you know, Hubbard going on about how he's been exploited and taken advantage of, and he calls uh, Don Purcell a moneyed Montebank in, not even Mountebank, Montebank in one of the, the letters. Now he's got to make something out of nothing, and he makes it very clear what that nothing is. February 52, he's now talking about Scientology and says this is what it was always called, this is, you know, a Dianetics was just another name for the, for the thing. But you, re, you see that he can't use engram running anymore. He's also had terrible problems. In Science of Survival, he cancels the earlier technique that was reintroduced in the late 70s as book one auditing because he says, you know, you'll see people's eyelids flickering. This is a sign of them going into hypnotic trance. Now, when it was reissued in 77 in the, the book one course, it's got it right back there again. You wait until the, the, the person's eyelids flicker and that they've gone into reverie, you know. So he cancelled it as hypnotic and then brought it back. But now he's got to make something without the use of Engram's second rhythm locks. And he hits upon the Alistair Crowley material that has so absorbed him and obsessed him during the, the decade before. Um, as Elrond Hubbard Jr. said, you know, Crowley was his guru, he was his god. And, um, of course, in the PDC, he, he calls him, you know, my very good friend, Alistair Crowley, though they never met. The only reference we have from Crowley are letters where he's calling him a con man, basically. But nonetheless, and you get the ab adoption of techniques. So if you look at creative processing, which is the central technique of those endless Philadelphia doctorate course lectures, but... No, not bad. You could get a doctorate in six weeks just by sitting there and listening. You don't have to do three years, four years of hard work. <laughs> um, only 500 bucks. Um, he now sells this one technique, creative processing, which, of course, is now called visualization and comes straight from Alistair Crowley. You know, the way it's done, it's absolutely... When I wrote, I wrote a, a, a paper called Possible Origins for Dianetics and Scientology, um, because uh, Jeff Jacobson had done a brilliant paper showing, you know, comparative material in other groups. What I wanted to do was to take what Jeff had done and say, was Hubbard aware of this material? So 
I, I collected all sorts of stuff together. And I think I found 120 uh, acts of plagiarism in Scientology and Dianetics. Um, 60 of those were Crowley. There are things like uh, calling reincarnation past lives. Uh, the birth engram. Crowley talks about that long before. Well, he's dead three years before Dianetics is published. So he's talking about it. I found um, if you look at the first edition of Dianetics on the back cover, it was a medical publisher, Hermitage House. Uh, yes. And on the back cover, there's an advert for a book by Dr. Nandor Fodor called The Search for the Beloved, um, an investigation into uh, prenatal uh, the prenatal condition and, and birth, where and, we, and I, of course, got a copy of that book and read it. So a year before Dianetics, you've got somebody talking about the birth engram, prenatal conditioning. It wasn't a new idea. No. Hubbard must have been aware of it because it's on the back of his own book, you know? Well, indeed. And, and, and just going back into um, the Eastern uh, mystical tr traditions, they would call it the shock of birth. Yeah. And you, that, that's been around for 2,000 years or longer, the shock of birth. Yeah. Now, something I wanted to clarify for, for new time listeners, much is made of Hubbard's uh, adoration of Aleister Crowley, his use of his work. Yep. And uh, Aleister Crowley, of course, is infamous for having written, Do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Do, do, do what thou wilt, which, by the way, is a quotation from Rabelais. It's not original to Crowley. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But th but there's an understanding among among esotericists, um, black magic practitioners, left hand path, whatever you mm. want to call them. Sinister. It is. Left. Do as, yes. Do as thou will shall be the whole of law. What that really means, it's, it's, it's not anarchy because it doesn't mean go out and do whatever you want to do. Most of the people who practice black magic or or the left hand path and some Thelemites, though not all, believe that most humans don't have the willpower to truly do what they will. Yeah. So the fo the focus is on developing the power of will, yeah. but also being completely immoral about it. Yeah, Cro Crowley talked about it. I mean, I, I had to read Crowley, who I personally find odious, you know. Yes, I agree. Uh, but, and I hated reading him, but I had to read him to understand Hubbard. And there's a, I also had the good fortune to interview his biographer, uh, his literary executor, John Simons, hmm. who, who was fascinating. Yeah. He was quite old by then, he was about 80, and, and um, he said, he was an awful man, and the bastard <laughs> left me as his literary executor because he knew I hated him. And he'd left Simons, you know, this is sort of, what, 35 years later. Simon has spent the rest of his life writing about Crowley, who he hated. But he picks up a story where Crowley, when he was um, still with the Golden Dawn, I think, uh, so before the First World War, he was using a, he would carry a razor blade in his pocket. And if at any point he did something that he felt went against his will, he would cut himself. Really? Yeah. So he was developing, he was trying to develop willpower. I, th I think they, they were probably big on Schopenhauer and you know, the note which, you know, of course, the Nazis picked up that idea of having a pure will. And in, in modern psychology, the, the idea is just dissipated. There is no will left, you know, in the, in the modern view of the mind. But it was this idea that you could construct this magical presence. The other thing to really get about the integration between Thelemic sex magic and Scientology is the body Thetan. Hubbard started selling the idea of entities in 1952 and he got no takers. Uh, mm. He'd had a hundred, he'd sold 150,000 copies of Dianetics before the publisher pulled it because he realized it was a scam. Art Sepos pulled the book because he realized it was a scam and then published uh, Dr. Joe Winter's doctor's report on Dianetics and of course Winter had been with Hubbard throughout the writing of Dianetics and they'd come away and wrote a book saying well I think Dianetics is good but Hubbard's a dreadful human being you know so they do that but he'd had 150,000 he'd been in Look magazine he'd been a real star by the time of the Philadelphia doctorate course he had 38 people on the course um, I corresponded with Helen O'Brien who ran Hubbard's organization the Hubbard Association of Scientologists then and ran that course. Uh, 
Um, and of course, gave us the fascinating 1953 letter where Hubbard's talking about the religion angle, you know, and how much more money they'd make if they were a religion, you know. Of um, course. And John, I wanted to interject. This is so interesting. People don't really appreciate it, how Scientology would call it a stat crash, but Hubbard absolutely cratered after Dianetics for a yeah. period of time. Oh, for a long fact, period, not till the late 1960s would he have a, a sizable following again. Oh, n not at all. In fact, um, uh, Dianetics sells 150,000 copies. Science of Survival, as I understand it, only sold 1,250 copies. Yeah, that sounds about right. Which is uh, a 99%, you know, plunge. Mm. And when the when the floor comes out from under Hubbard, uh, there's a tape called Electropsychometric Scouting Battle of the Universes. He and Mary Sue did, I believe when they started the Hubbard College for six weeks in Wichita. Yep. And they get an entity on the E-meter. Yep. So you, what you're saying then is that Hubbard tried to float the idea of body thetans even back in the early 50s with no takers. Yeah, and he then realized that the thing to do is to make it a secret. But the, mm. bo the body thetan is the essential part. If you look at Thelemic magic, um, black, white, or gray, wh wherever you go, People have this kind of Disney idea that, that these magicians perform spells. And there is something in that. But usually these spells, when you go back to... You know, I, I talked with the OTO, two of the OTOs. I think there are three in all now. Everything has its factions. And they were very obliging and very helpful, I must say. Um, I still felt I ought to keep them at arm's length. But um, realising that these spells are normally sent wrapped around a body thing that the idea of the entity is that the entity is a, is a delivery system for a piece of magic and so you collect them and i had this really weird thought one day which was well maybe what hubbard was doing and i don't actually i'm sorry to say this but i don't believe in body thetans um but, but hubbard was you know maybe in some recess of his mind he was actually collecting people's body thetans so he could you know power up his own will and use these things in some bizarre magical operation it is it is weird but if you look at it from the perspective of a magician it it ceases to be weird it becomes absolutely everyday life you collect entities or you believe you're collecting entities so that you can use them as weapons well yeah this is interesting let's bracket this uh, aside from other uh, just bracket it you know yep. mentally in prior traditions a body thetan would have been called an elemental spirit yes elementals are my slaves as he says or your slaves as he says in the affirmations yeah exactly that elemental spirits will be his slaves yeah and in, in traditional uh, uh magic with a k elementals are your slave they're to do your bidding and in fact what interested me and i've studied Salima extensively, if I've read Crowley, just like you, I find him ab abhorrent, but mm. nevertheless, as a researcher, I read Scientology hate websites. Yeah. I read Crowley, because a researcher, you have to see what the other side is saying. Yes, of course. Now, now, now Salima is very preoccupied with the banishing and summoning of spirits. Yes. And what stood out to me in the OT levels, you're only ever... You summon the BTs through the mechanism of the meter. That is, you get them on the meter, correct? So that could be a sort of a summoning. And then you banish them. Yep. And unlike Thelema, when you, you banish these BTs, or Hubbard characterized them as low power, you know, low powered entities, mm -hmm. uh, you don't give them anything to do. Nice. But, but what you're saying, Hubbard in his own mind may have been collecting and amassing well, these, right. in, in, you know, there is another, to, there's another oh, step ahead. to this idea, and, and that is, you know, uh, as, as Hubbard said, you've got the, the pieces, the players, and the game maker. Mm. The only time he admits it, and it's right there, David Miscavige is the player, and the player is, a, is the only one that knows the rules. The game maker doesn't have to follow the rules. Now, Hubbard's the game maker. He's the god maker. And he didn't follow the rules. As I say, he, he was a junkie. He, he was a drunk. Um, you know, there is nothing nice or pleasant about him when you get down to 
what he was doing to the people around him. Um, and the mystical manipulation, making people feel that he was compassionate or had magical abilities, you know, when in fact they were just being conned. Um, but, but you get this thing that, how about this? If you believed in body thetans, who would be the hero of a body thetan that had been that had gone through Scientology? It's got to be Hubbard, hasn't it? So where yes. is, where are they going to go? Who are they going to look for? What are they going to find? Now, we do know that at the end of his life from Sarge Fouth, we know that Hubbard basically believed the body Satan's had taken over. When I interviewed Virginia Downsborough, she rescued Hubbard from Gran Canaria after he'd researched OT3. And she, told, she was invited into the Sea Project and, and she rejected the offer. I, I interviewed her first in 1986. And she said, when I got there, he hadn't eaten for three days. He was crazy. He was out of his mind. And all he was surviving on a shelf full of drugs. And she held her hands up about two feet apart to show how many bottles of drugs there had been. We were pretty sure that Demerol, the opioid, opiate Demerol, was one of these drugs. And he'd taken all these things. But what he said to Virginia uh, was... That, that he'd lost, that the body Thetans were going to get him. And so you've got this, I don't know, conflict. You know, I think Yuval Laor's idea that Hubbard had temporal lobe epilepsy is probably true because the, the kind of conflicts in thinking in his own mind, the, the massive contradictions in his own statements can, you know, if you add paranoia, narcissism and manic depression to the diagnosis, then you've got somebody who at one time thinks one thing and another another so he thought that he was plagued and overwhelmed by body thetans at certain times in his life but i also believe that, that means the opposite would be true that he felt he was in command of them and it's just this this odd little thought you know it's speculative and who cares sure. that maybe scientology is a magical operation in the traditional crowleyite sense i put together the um, the Babylon working and realised that it has been misreported that if you went to the there's a book by I think it was Francis King who actually published The Rituals of the OTO and it's a, it's a rare book um, because OTO people like Scientologists don't want it to be out there huh. and if you go to the 8th level OTO 8 as I like to think of it um, then you find the ritual that they were performing and that's why Crowley was upset. All of the accounts of it seem to suggest that, that Jack Parsons and Hubbard had invented this ritual. No, it's the top level of the OTO. And um, it's, uh, I, I was criticised for calling it a homosexual ritual. And I, I take the criticism. I called it that because Parsons masturbated with Hubbard watching. And that seems a bit gay to me, you know. Um, but then I don't have any problem with people being gay, whereas Hubbard had a massive problem with people being gay and appears to have engaged in gay sex on a number of occasions himself, which is one of the contradictions that we would expect in Hubbard's life. Um, but there is this thought that maybe, you know, various things, maybe Scientology is uh, an outgrowth of, of the US Navy's Bluebird project which was the first mind control project before MK Naomi and MK Ultra. Certainly the only reference I know of to those terrible psychological programs before Freedom of Information in the 70s, when, you know, Boas and Alan Shefflin and people wrote books about what the CIA and people have been doing. The only reference before that is in Science of Survival in 1951, where Hubbard talks about government programs to do this. It's kind of weird that yeah, he would have known that. And so there's, I remember talking with um, Lawrence Wallerstein many years ago, and he would thought that one through as well, that maybe Dianetics and Scientology was, was some kind of intel program to see if you could apply mind control to a mass of people. I don't think they'd have been foolish enough to use Hubbard to do that. I think it's probably just that he knew Robert Heinlein. Heinlein had security clearance. Heinlein knew about the the project and told Hubbard. I think that's all it is, but it might not be. But the other aspect is that magical aspect 
that Scientology becomes a way of, I mean, um, Mark Rathbun uh, a few years ago published something saying that he'd realised that Hubbard wished to be deified. And I, I was probably a little bit, I don't know, a little bit embittered about it. I didn't respond to him on his blog site, but I published a blog at Tony's site saying, yeah, here's the paragraph in <laughs> Let's Sell These People a Blue Sky, Piece of Blue Sky, published in 1990, where I say Scientology is probably Hubbard trying to, you know, the apotheosis of L. Ron Hubbard. Um, you know, in much the same way that the, both the Chinese and the Romans traditionally believed that you have to be made immortal. You don't have an immortal soul. It's only by people worshipping you and praying to you. Um, you know, Robert Graves in I, Claudius has uh, um, Augustus's wife, Livia, begging Claudius to make me a god, meaning make people worship me because then I'll live after my death. And I think Hubbard had something of that going on. I think Mark was right about that, but he didn't realise the next bit, which is kind of weird, which is if Scientology is a way of making Elrond Hubbard into a god, then it probably isn't doing you any good. To respond to a couple of your points, which are so very fascinating, it would be easy to speculate that Scientology was a magical operation created in the Babylon working by Jack Parsons and Elrond Hubbard. Yeah, extended from it, yeah. Yeah. Number two it's less likely that the U.S. government would have had anything to do with um, Scientology in that period of time due to the innate risks that L. Ron Hubbard carried with him as an operative or an agent. Absolutely. In, in, in other words, you simply would not pick a man of his, his defective character to undertake a, a, a control program. He, alternately, if anything, he would be a dupe. Yeah, that doesn't make sense because of his rapacious appetites for, for money, drugs, sex. So he's, he wouldn't be a reliable terminal, in other words. But on the other um, hand, if you look at the way that intelligence agencies recruit, that's exactly the type of person they recruit, somebody they can blackmail. And they had enough material on Hubbard to sink him at any minute. Um, the reason that Wallachan and I both came to this was that we saw the way that the, the Scientology was protected through the 70s, through the 80s, in, to this day, I mean... Every year, the Secretary of State stands up and condemns Germany for being anti-religious because it won't have Scientologists in the civil service. So there seemed to be an inordinate influence that Scientology had that maybe was because there was somebody watching what he was doing. Because let's face it, Scientology is the most effective form of mind control ever developed. There's nothing that comes near it. Uh, no, and to that point... L. Ron Hubbard was not arrested in program Snow White. No. He was, he was exempted, which would suggest... An, in, an unindicted you know, co-conspirator, along with Kendrick Moxon, of course, and 37 yeah. others, yeah. Something to speculate about there. When you look at Scientology as a cultic mind control operation, how does the E-meter work? How does it actually work? What does it do to people? Well, I, I think... <clears throat> Something that's usually missed is, is that it's a, a primitive form of TENS machine. Mm. Um, so you're getting some pain relief from it, um, quite naturally. Um, though they're the original Matheson meter, of course, they had to earth you to a radiator because otherwise it might <laughs> literally blow your mind. Um, wow. But now, now say that again, the Matheson meter, that they had to ground you? Yeah, it, it ran from mains electricity. Really? Yeah, in 53. Um, and of course, they've been around for a long time. Jung was using them in the 1920s. There's nothing original about the thought of using a Wheatstone bridge. I, th I think that the, the other element is, is what Robert J. Lifton calls sacred science. That uh, and Nowadays, in England, we've got this guy who uses the word sciency, you know, something that mm. looks scientific. And, and Hubbard, I mean, he, um, I was in touch with um, Perry Chapterlain I think he's still around, it must be in his 90s. And Chapter Lane was a mathematician. And, you know, he's still very pro Hubbard when I talked to him. Um, but, you know, whatever. He, he told me this story about the Dianetic Axioms. And he said, well, Hubbard said, look, grab a bottle of bourbon and we'll sit down because we've got to have something scientific sounding. Mm. So Hubbard was very aware of this, you know, the use of authority through science to say this is a scientific thing. And the e meter gives that impression um you know until you 
I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell another story about e-meters. In the 80s, I had a friend called Barry Pemberthy, and he developed what's called the ability meter, which many of the independents started using. And he said that he'd been a, an e-meter repairman at, at St. Hill in the 60s, and he and his friend, and he always attributed the development to his friend and not to himself, but he said they they mended e-meters and they were just wondering why the cheapest possible components were used. You know, they were still using germanium transistors, which you know, nobody had even heard of anymore because they were really cheap. And so they decided what, what would happen if you built a, this was the Mark V, what would happen if you built a meter using the most expensive components? And he said, for example, in our ability meter, the jewel that we pivot the needle on costs more than all of the components from Mark V just the jewel. So they built this meter and they're very pleased themselves and they put a, um, a pen recorder and they put impulses into both a Mark V and the ability meter at the same time and they had pen recorders on both of them and they went to the pub and had a drink. And when they came back after some hours of this, these machines being given identical stimuli, there were twice as many readings on the pen recorder from the Mark V. And at first they were very disappointed. They, they thought they'd just done something wrong. So they decided the next time, instead of going to the pub and having a drink, they'd watch. And what they found was that 50% of all the readings on a Mark V meter were generated from the faulty electronics in the meter. Um, the Mark VI and the Mark VII didn't really change that. The, yeah, we got this silver ceiling business in, in the early 80s where all meters were called back in and you got to pay for them to be serviced. And what they're actually doing was replacing the carbon potentiometers on the tone arm because every time you move the tone arm, it was grinding off carbon, which was going into the works, which, of course, was creating rock slams, among other things. I mean, I'm, I should think anybody who's been in Scientology has seen an unplugged e-meter rock slamming. I certainly saw it a few times. So there is nothing... Nobody's plugged in, and the damn thing, you know, creates these reads itself, which was kind of disappointing for, you know, when two-thirds of the crew at Flag were put on the RPF for being List 1 rock slammers, you know, given that the meter's making these, these things. So you've got a very imprecise instrument, but it has this mystique, this sacred science all around it. Yes, it does. And, in fact, John, I, in doing my research prior to the e-meter, Hubbard is so very interested in what is called psychometry. Yep. That is the, the art and measurement of psychological testing, IQ, ability, and so on. Yep. And this uh, psychometry uh, as a, an art, a science, emerged in World War II where you had to be able to classify people quickly. Yes. You know, in terms of aptitude and intelligence, so you could assign them in a, to military duty. Yep. And it's not an exact science, but it was, you know, approximately you could tell if someone was that ability mathematically or they could interpret or they were, you know, they could write. Yeah. So uh, Hubbard obsesses about psychometry. And in fact, in a, in a uh, his 1951 challenge to the American uh, Psychiatric Association, he says, let's do a test where we pick three people who are psychotic. We run them through Dianetics and then psychiatry and, and then measure them using psychometries afterwards. Well, a couple things. First of all, it shows that Hubbard won't finance his own damn study. <laughs> Two, he's craving to be benchmarked against psychiatry. Yep. I'm, I'm often suspicious. This 1947 letter where he writes to the VA saying he can't rise above his suicidal inclinations and his morosity. Yep. And, he, and he's asks for psychiatric help. Sometimes to me, because he's out having fun, you know, with uh, Sarah and Jack Parsons living it up. He's taking acting classes. I often wondered if he lied and he just wanted to get some free psychoanalysis to see what it was like to benchmark his own work against it. I wonder if that was a ruse. I don't think so. Um, no? No, Sarah actually talks about him, yes, having terrible fits of depression mm. uh, and, you know, in the affirmations, there's a thing, it says, you know, when you leave the examination, you'll be perfectly fine. So you see that he's using affirmations to get himself into this state. Mm. Um, if you look at uh, Barbara Cloden's interview, which we put up 
it, it was she did an interview with Secret Life of Aaron Hubbard, which I eventually, you know, the, the production company very kindly gave me all of their interviews. So that brilliant sort of one hour documentary, I've got 30 hours of material. And in her interview, Barbara Coden was his girlfriend during his marriage to Sarah in late 1950 in Los Angeles. She went off and, and became uh, a psychologist afterwards. Hubbard proposed marriage to her. She turned him down. Um, and she then looks back as a psychologist on his state of mind. And she talks about him being yeah, so morose that he wouldn't get out of bed for three days. Um, Jim Dean Kelsey, who also, of course, after leaving Hubbard, went and became a psychologist. He confirms the same behavior in 1972, that Hubbard is so, is so depressive that he cannot function for days on end. And he sounds very much like the so-called vulnerable narcissist or the collapsed narcissist, that if people don't adulate him, he doesn't exist. Getting back to Hubbard in 47. So he does. He is actually, in your opinion, seeking genuine psychiatric help. Yes. And um, why does he wind up hating psychiatry so much? Well, uh, psychiatry, psychology, psychotherapy, all of the, any, any word with, with Suke at the beginning of it. Um, in uh, two of the f first five Dianetic Foundations were run by psychologists. There's an interesting fact. So he didn't have this initially. I think it's when Sarah has a psychiatrist diagnose him for the, for the divorce case, which is what stimulates him to steal Alexis and run away to Cuba. Hmm. That, that he, he definitely has a kind of paranoid um, aspect to him. I mean, I, I talk with enough people about, about that. I mean, talking to, say, John McMaster, the world's first real clear, an interesting and bizarre human being himself in my experience of him. Um, but he, he talked about Hubbard sort of crying in the corner of the room and going on about how people were after him. I, I was amazed when I first read Freud to, that it was like reading Hubbard, that you've got this guy who first of all believed he was the greatest person who'd ever lived. You know, with Hubbard, it's what, in, in 50,000 years, there have been no other developments yeah. <laughs> in the mind or spirit but mine. You know, a small claim to make. Whereas, of course, early on, you know, there are great lists of the people who, you know, including Anaxagoras for some reason. In Scientology 8008, you've got this great list of people. There's another one in Science of Survival who'd contributed. And the truth is, of course, that all of the ideas were pillaged. The, the, the one thing I concluded about Hubbard is he never had an original idea in his life. You know, that, that wasn't him. He was very good at grabbing other people's ideas, twisting them a little, because you have to alter is something to make it persist, don't you? Twisting yes. it and then exporting it. And McMaster talked about the introduction of uh, the fair game and the suppressive person material, um, which of course had origins much earlier in the 50s, the Merchants of Chaos and all of that. And he said that he could never understand, because he said to it, but he said, he said, Ron, um, why don't we help these people? Because all we're doing is running away from them, you know. Wow. Disconnection, you know, why don't we do something? Because that would make the world a better place. And it was, it was that he hadn't understood that this was an aspect of Hubbard's paranoia. That, you know, when you look at the, if you put together a list of all the people who worked directly for Hubbard from 1950 onwards, and you see how many of them managed to stay with him until they died. And there aren't many. There really aren't many. Almost everybody turned out to be an SP. I've often considered Scientology to be Elrin Hubbard's immortality project, his personal yep. immortality project, because the magician lives on through his words. Yep. And it's so very interesting that the Church of Spiritual Technology exists to archive Hubbard's words into perpetuity. Yes. As of 2012, it was funded with about $450 million. Yep. There's many streams that run into it, including it being his personal immortality project. Oh, I think it's absolutely that. And, and I think it's a very desperate, it, it's, it's a, an aspect of his depression, as I think it is for many people who, who seek spiritual perpetuity, that, that they're distressed and it's a way of trying to deal with their distress. And that's the other thing about Hubbard, to get that the public face of Hubbard <laughs> 
and and the private man are very different things having talked with so many people who knew him privately that he was so often desperate and distressed and ill and all of the things that you'd kind of attribute to somebody who was massively pts in his terms and it's always wow. forgiven because he was researching things and that's what was making him poorly you know there's this great story that um charlie nan told charlie nan is among my heroes he, he and among my friends which is great he's the guy that made the shrinking world of Elron hubbard in 1968 which is still the best statement ever made it's better than piece of blue sky it's better than anything that fantastic little 20 minute film because you see hubbard for who he is the only hostile tv interview and he says when he got there to desert in tunisia having finally found out where the ship was um it's one in the morning and he sees Hubbard walking along the deck and he, he, he calls up and he says, can I come aboard? And Hubbard says, yes. And he's apprehensive because Hubbard's actually suing him for um, Faith for Sale, the documentary he'd made the year before. And of course, being a great OT, Hubbard would know that this was the man he was suing, you know. Uh, <laughs> but he didn't. And he sat there for two hours talking with Charlie, just the two of them, with no tape running. And Charlie, when he first contacted me a few years ago, he was still really upset that he hadn't got Hubbard to say on film what he said privately. Because Charlie put it to him, this is a scam, isn't it? And Hubbard went, well, of course it is. Don't be an idiot. Of course it is. Charlie then made just the most beautiful observation. He said, you must be very lonely. And Hubbard, being narcissistic, went, yes, it's awful not being able to tell anybody how I'm conning them, you know. I'm wow. so alone, you know. So Charlie then said, why do you do it? And I think this is the big question. He said, well, it's very nice being able at the end of every day to, to tell your wife that you've made $10,000 that day, you know, in 1968. So you're talking about making, I don't know what that would be, about $200,000 a day. But, so it's nice to be able to boast to your wife about that. But what, the reason I really do it is, I like to catch the clever ones and reel them in. Hmm. And that immediately to me says disturbed 10 year old. This is a kid who nobody liked in his school fellows, but he's got his grandfather and his aunts. Also, his mother was seems to have been fairly emotionally cold and his, his father was not very involved in them. But he's got these people telling him how fantastic he is. And so he's trying to live up to it. He's trying to become that person. And that's, it's one strand. There's more than one identity involved here. You know, there, there's more than one, you know, there's not a simple motivation for what he's doing, but he becomes narcissistic. I think he also got kicked in the head by one of those horses because I, you know, as I say, as Yuval Laor says, I think he had temporal lobe epilepsy. If you look at the Bear Fideo trait list, the 18 traits, he had them all. When Yuval first showed them to me, and, I, you know, it's weird because I, I did know about this condition. I just never thought about it. I was able with 17 of the traits to immediate 17 out of 18 to immediately identify them. You've did a little thing with Chris Shelton about it, which, which I don't think was very successful. It didn't get into the detail. I've interviewed you, Val, but I've, I've not published the interviewers yet where we, we got into a bit more detail. When that interview went up, you had a contact from a, a, a retired professor of neuroscience who said that he'd spent years collecting an archive of material about Hubbard because Hubbard fascinated him right he never talked about it but he collected this massive information and he's a neuroscientist and he said you know I was there in 77 I think it was when temporal lobe epilepsy was first the first paper on it was read I was in the room. I've been studying Hubbard all these years. And I never brought the two things together. And looking at it, yes, he had temporal lobe epilepsy. And you look at some of the, for example, hypographia, that they cannot help but write. They have to be writing. Well, he's mm. in his book of world records is the most prolific. Um, yeah, we all know that Scientology submitted everything he wrote at least four times in different forms to get him there. But nonetheless, talking with people around him on the ship, you know, I, I said to an ex seal guy, you know, Hubbard was fat and lazy and extremely rude. And he said he wasn't lazy you know, <laughs> um, because I saw him, you know, writing and writing and writing and going. But it was compulsive. He couldn't help it. 
you know. And he himself, of course, in 1950, criticizes people who become the authority on a subject and just produce more and more and more material to retain their authority without really saying anything, which is most certainly true of Scientology. It's, as you say, it was pretty much developed by the end of 1953. There's very little added. It's just refining it and, you know, walking round and round the same points. Yes, it becomes a variation on a theme. Scientology is fascinating. Hubbard is a study, is certainly a study in, in human nature. Yeah. Organically, so many people contributed to Scientology and Hubbard put his name on their work. Yeah. And yet at the well, core of it... Well, he gave doctorates until 1965. And then when he had to renounce his own doctorate because he'd been caught, he said there have been some minor contributions, there have been some contributions, all of them minor. And you go, right, for example, the upper inductiars, they're minor, aren't they? Because that was Aaron Hubbard Jr. The original bulletin says Aaron Hubbard Jr. They just took the junior off it. Or uh, TR2, that's uh, uh, Evans Farber. Or, no, it's Burton Farber. So th there are whole pieces that come from other places all along the way. And eventually, because he's a narcissist, it, you know, the only good things, is, you know, he must have done them. And I, I think he did probably convince himself of that. Well, ultimately, he would have had to, to be source. And in KSW, he said people have contributed, but it didn't amount to anything. I've learned that, a, you know, a group would be uh, aberrated. Yeah. In other words, with KSW, he, he negates any contributions. Absolutely. And, does. Having, having recognized them again and again and again through the 50s, um, but you've even got things like, you know, there are some very peculiar things. Some of the professional auditors bulletins are actually written by Paul Twitchell, who would then go on to found Eckenkar. Uh, that is an amazing fact. I didn't know. And they John, just I take like... his name off them, you know, and it becomes a, a Ron Hubbard did this, you know. John, I'd like to pick up on another interview. There's just so much we didn't even get to what you're doing nowadays. Let's sell these people a piece of blue sky by John Atack. It's a must read. If you want to be serious about your research into Scientology, it's the definitive book. And John, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Let me let me push one other thing. My my recent book is is called Opening Minds: A Secret World of um, Manipulation, Undue Influence, and Brainwashing. For for people who want to understand how Scientology works psychologically, it 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 might they might find it interesting. I've I've had people who have involved for a very long time come to me and say oh my god that's what was done to me so you know please buy a copy of that too <laughs> oh I would it's the first thing I'm going to buy after we uh, we end the show here so thank you John Atak for surviving Scientology radio this is your host Jeffrey Augustine thank you for listening and as always we'll be in very good touch <laughs>